skitty. We on. All right, what is up? It's the book reviews. What's up? The first, the first real episode, one point oh. Put us back. Do we need it? Okay. What are we talking about? So first thing we're going to talk about is a book that I've read recently. And this book is John Adams by David McCullough. You may have heard of it. You may have heard of John Adams. Um, so uh, starting out, great book. I gave it a 5 out of 5 on Goodreads uh, for a couple reasons. Um, and we'll get into them all here shortly. But if you don't know, John Adams was the second president of the United States. Before that, a uh, very active foreign diplomat in France and Holland and a couple other places, brokering deals, getting resources, and things like that. Um, staunch uh, abolitionist, ab- abhorred slavery. He and his wife both did, um, which was actually something I was not aware of. Super cool. So, a mm. um, couple big things in his life to tell you who John Adams is. Uh, Early on, they're reviewing a book on uh, Goodreads. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, I have it right now. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What's it look like? All right, like? so you rated it what? You rated it five? I gave, I gave it five, yeah. Hey, strong. All right, so, oh, this is the Pulitzer Prize winner as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Big deal. So it has 350,000 reviews. That's a lot. So it's a popular book, or well, ratings, I'm sorry, ratings, 7,000 reviews. So it's got a 4.07 rating which i feel like is pretty good with over three hundred and fifty thousand reviews like that's that's solid yeah solid for sure. winning biography yep yes so very popular book obviously it's renowned uh david mccullough himself is a renowned author mm. uh and historian uh they did make an hbo show uh, based upon the book uh i didn't know that yeah paul giamatti is john adams it's actually really good and they stick is that older i don't even think i've seen that uh yeah it's probably 10 or 15 years old at this point um but uh john adams had a lot of cool things he did uh, i learned a lot i did not know much about john adams other than that he was a founding father and uh the second president of the United States. Um, didn't know he only served one term. Um, learned that, obviously. But early on in his life, obviously, like I said, he always abhorred slavery. His wife, Abigail, is super smart. Um, yeah, I feel like she's one of the more famous yeah. ladies. Yeah, and I mean, even in this book and other works, even more so, there's a lot of suggestions that she was, you know, he- like way more involved in mm. helping him make decisions than most women were with their husbands in politics at that time, um, which is pretty cool. Again, Pretty progressive in a lot of ways with yeah. with his wife, with the anti-slavery stuff. Um, early on in his life, uh, one of the most profound moments before uh, you know the revolution and everything was an event that occurred in the town he was living in. And wow, I'm such a bum for not remembering where it was. But essentially, a mob where he grew up. No, no, no. This is where he was living in, oh, okay, in the okay. colony. Um, I think uh, Phil- Philadelphia, if I remember correctly. Um. There were four or six British soldiers and a mob, basically, of, uh, you know, colony people, Americans, um, start kind of taunting them, throwing rocks. And basically an altercation breaks out where uh, a couple people get shot. The British soldiers soldiers end up shooting people. And at this point, there's a lot of animosity. This is not the Boston Massacre. No, no, no. 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 Wait, is this the Boston Massacre? <laughs> That's pretty, pretty big event in history. This is not the Boston Massacre. <laughs> Because I can promise you the Boston Massacre did not happen in Philadelphia. It definitely didn't <laughs> happen there. Because uh, this is this is pre-America. This is yeah. colonial. No, it's not colonial yeah, America. No, this, this is, is the Boston Massacre. So oh, yeah, it's in Boston. Okay. Yeah. So he was there. Yeah, he was there when it happened. Showed up like that. right after to help like, you know, okay. like saw dead people. Um, All that. <laughs> so uh, he's a lawyer. And no one will do it, but he ends up being asked and decides to defend these British soldiers, which, Ooh, again, a lot of that. animosity. Yeah. But he saw it as his duty because, again, he's a lawyer. No one else yeah. would defend him. They had rights. Um, so basically, uh, he goes in, gets him off scot-free for nothing because he essentially makes the point that, okay, you guys were a mob with rocks and pitchforks and flamethrowers, and these are yeah. centuries that have a job to do, and you guys attacked them. So it was at a time, and that seems super simple to us now, and it really is, but at the time, tensions were so high that the people just expected, we're going to just off these people. We're trying to revolt. (laughs) But at that time, um, Adams, you know, saw the law for what it was, and 
anyway, that's kind of the most profound moment in his life before uh, the revolution. Then, obviously, as the revolution starts occurring, he becomes a foreign diplomat. So he spends a lot of time in France with Benjamin Franklin. He goes to a couple other places, Holland. Um, one of the interesting things that you learn, too, is that young John Quincy is with him on a lot of these travels, which is crazy. I mean, he's like okay. 15 years old, running around all over the place, learning different languages. He was, I mean, Qu John Quincy was 15 times smarter at age 14 than I am right now. Dude, I wonder what that moment. was like, bro. I mean, just knew all the people, Pulling did all up the to things. Paris and hang out with Ben Franklin. I mean, so this is post. This is post America. Well, this is after they declare independence. Yeah, okay. I kind of skipped over that because yeah. you know we all know what happened. Uh, I mean, to not skip over it, you can say that John Adams was heavily involved in yeah. the writing of the Constitution. He wrote he wrote the Massachusetts Constitution himself. Thomas Jefferson obviously wrote the De Declaration. Which of they were, if I'm not mistaken, was he adversary? I want to say adversaries, but was he a rival with with old TJ or no? So that's actually, I mean, there's books written about that. I have one right here that I haven't read, Friends Divided by Gordon Wood, about John oh, Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Okay. So, yeah, they actually had a whole, it's crazy, man. So they started out as really intimate friends, like loved each other, all that yeah. shit were back then, like best buddies, writing letters all the time. Freemasons. All that. Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. We'll never know. <laughs> um, but then later, as things go by, they politically end up disagreeing on stuff, particularly on stuff like France. Um, yeah. Very different uh, beliefs. But... It's crazy. They essentially politically hate each other for a long period of their adult lives and careers, but in the end, in both the last decade or less than their, of their life, they rekindle their friendship, and then they both die on the same day on the 50th anniversary of, uh, or was it 50th? I might be pushing it. On one of the anniversaries of uh, July 4th. They both okay. died. Um, I mean, hey, what's more American? I mean, it's super American. They went out at the same time. But anyway, just to briefly get through the rest, uh, he becomes president. Um, very controversial figure, but obviously was very trusted and seemed seen as reliable by the mm. American people. But Thomas Jefferson was much more popular, which is why he comes in and, you know, John Adams does not yeah. get that second term. John Adams also obviously had the built in dagger of coming in after George Washington. Yeah, who I think was it was you that was telling me that, that basically without Washington, John Adams would have been like forever seen as washington yeah he would have been seen as the guy like but obviously he didn't have the military prowess and all the things that he did leading the country yeah. and holding them together which don't get me wrong george washington deserved yeah, every bit of credit he got some hell of hell um, of moments dude but adams is underappreciated i think in history for all the diplomatic yeah. stuff he did and he failed sometimes and he did make mistakes because he was a really brash guy um that's something you learn too like in his relationship with his kids like he was tough on his kids all that kind of stuff so he's definitely that kind of guy yeah but he was just very staunch in his beliefs so anyway he's president all that stuff um some pretty interesting things do go down in his presidency but to just get to the book um it's a little dense of a read david mcculloch can get a little dense sometimes but it's never at any point where you feel like um like it's too much. It all feels like necessary information to continue John yeah. Adams' story to give you context. So there was no point in the book. Um, more for time restraints for me. It did take a little longer to read than it should have, but um, it was not because it was dense or boring. I did not. Find How it hard that would way. you say on a scale of one to ten uh, from all the other historical nonfiction biographies you've read? Um, I mean, his, again, David McCullough, man. I mean, his, his writing, writing is, is supreme, yeah. and it's also. It's not simple because he's extremely smart, uses lots of big words, all that's good stuff. But it is written to where just about anybody, if they want to read and they want to learn about it, can get through it because it mm. is pretty engaging for a biography. Yeah. Um, and again, he's just easy to read. The man knew how to write. Yeah. Um, is he dead? I believe so. I'm pretty sure he died. That's unfortunate. I mean, this book came out a while back, and he's looking pretty old. It came out in picture. 2001. Yeah. I mean, and he looks. May 1st. Looks like he's on, you know, the final stretch in that picture from 2001. Oh, he does. So. <laughs> wow. Um, but, yeah, great writer. Uh, I would say as far as, you know, do you want to read this? Obviously, you need to be into history, I think, to a degree. But even if you aren't, I think this is a very important book because you do get the revolution. You get a lot about Washington and Thomas Jefferson and obviously John Adams. Mm. And these are three – those are three of the – those are the three most yeah. important figures in American history you know, other than like Abraham Lincoln. And so a if you others. read this book, not knowing anything about American history, you can sound like, you know, some stuff. Cause you're you not get just getting stuff. John, you're getting George yeah. Thomas. You're getting Jefferson. all the context and okay. you lived in that prime time. And then you're not only getting that, you're getting the French revolution, which is okay. pretty important too, especially okay. given the time. So, um, yeah, five out of five for me, thought it was great. Um, 
the biggest thing again is just David McAuliffe is a god. So really anybody I think can read it, but especially if you're into uh, biographies, especially yeah. if you're into American history, this is a this has got to be one of the ones you read at some point. Um, Which let's see how many pages this is just for the the viewer here if they want to really just know what they're by. Honestly, it's the just looking at the pages, it's not as daunting as it looks from the outside. No. Like there's I mean it's it's tight, but not like what you'd think. Yeah. So there's five hundred and fifty six pages. It's not Chernow's Washington. No. <laughs> yeah, dude. The pages, I mean, there's some space on them. So this isn't you know It's not that bad. It really isn't. No. Um and yeah, again, I think it's super important as far as American history is concerned. Is it in your obviously. top ten? For historical nonfiction? I don't know. We'll have to see on the tier mm. list. I'll have okay. to really think about that we'll once about we get it. a tier list. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk with mm. the Lord. But to uh, before I get to anything you may have like to ask me or whatever comments you have, just a couple of quotes to just give okay. you a, yeah. an idea of the mind of John Adams. So okay. essentially to give you context, John Adams is sick for a little while um, and kind of isolated in his home. And he's writing a letter to someone about it. And I think this is uh, really pertinent to our times today. So okay. he says, I am convinced our own happiness requires that we should continue to mix with the world and to keep pace with it. I can speak from experience on the subject. From 1793 to 1797, I remained closely at home, saw none but those who came there, and at length became very sensible of the ill effect it had upon my own mind and of its direct and irresistible tendency to render me unfit for society and uneasy when necessarily engaged in it. I felt enough of the effect of withdrawing from the world then to see that it led to an antisocial and misanthro uh, misanthropic state of mind, which severely punishes him who gives into it, and it will be a lesson I shall never forget as to myself. Um, and misanthropic mm. is basically a hatred for humans and their human behavior i mean so super personal especially yeah, yeah yeah i mean with the with the lockdown and just the working at home and just the antisocial in general this is coming from a dude wow. that was around in 1776 yeah. reaching out from the past and saying yeah. hey you guys need to interact how close <laughs> was his nearest neighbor when he was born i mean <laughs> pretty far <laughs> pretty far Boy was out in the boonies um but yeah, there's actually there's a lot of quotes that he has that are just really good, uh, principle wise. Oh, here's another. Let me read this one. Yeah, this yeah, one's yeah. the highest um, marked quote on Goodreads for whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So it says, "The longer I live, the more I read, the more patiently I think, and the more anxiously I inquire. The less I seem to know. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. This is enough." I mean, hey, powerful bars. stuff. Bar, absolute bars. These guys had a way of talking, man, that they just say something so simple, but they say in a way where are like, wow, that is the answer. Mm. That is what we should be doing. And again, something that's really important about John Adams in particular, because there's obviously a fair argument that when you're talking about the founding fathers, you're talking about guys that had some comprom compromising characteristics, such as slave owning. Now, obviously, product of the time, things were yeah. different, but it's it still is important to... Uh, acknowledge that but also when you have a guy like john adams it's important to know that he was considered a radical this is oh yeah i mean this is almost a hundred years before you know emancipation. the conversations even going um, on yeah a hundred years before emancipation essentially a little less than that but almost a century before that he is looking around calling it like you know using words of, of the time of that language to be as negative about it as possible yeah calling it a scourge and talking about how i mean it a lot of people at the time did, but what's different about him, because even guys like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington will make comments like, yeah, this isn't good, and we shouldn't have this forever. But John yeah. Adams was a guy that said, well, I don't have them, and yeah. I don't think any of y'all should, and I think this is really important. And there's a really good Thomas letter. Thomas like, but I, but I love him. He's like, but I, I love I her. I love him. I love, I love her. I love her. <laughs> <laughs> she means the world to me, Adams. If it's in both hands. But there's a letter, there's a conversation of, of letters between Abigail and John Adams where Abigail actually makes the comment, and you get the idea from the back and forth that they're both on the same page. But she's basically saying, to paraphrase, yeah, I'm really excited for independence, freedom, all this stuff. This is great, but what are we talking about if we've got slaves? What are we talking about <laughs> in independence if we've got slaves? <laughs> like, And so it was cool Fair. to see that 
you know, they didn't see slaves or black people as three fifths of a man. They were like, these are people just like us. Yeah. And this is a blot on our society and will be a blot forever on our history. They make comments like that. So that's an especially important thing to think about if you're considering reading about a founding father and maybe you'd like to read about one of the ones that. Because he's not getting canceled. He's not getting canceled. He's not like Christopher Columbus. All these he's historical figures are getting canceled these days. He's pre- he's pretty much uncancelable when you look at him for the time that he lived in. I mean, he was a radical guy, really. So, um, yeah. Any questions? Anything I left out as far as uh, what should be discussed about this book? No. As far as like what's on Goodreads, I mean, I mean, you gave basically a, a solid synopsis of what what they have on here. I mean, yeah, made in two thousand one, about six hundred and fifty pages. For those of you wanting to know. Four star rating with three hundred fifty thousand reviews. Jesse gave it a five. I mean, it won a a Pulitzer Prize, so mm-hmm. only give out one of those a year per category. But pretty prestigious, pretty prestigious. So yeah, sounds like it's gonna have to get on that TBR. So can't wait to read that by twenty forty seven. Yeah, once you get this entire, <laughs> I'm, book gonna books, I'm gonna love it. I'm gonna love it. I know once I read, I'm gonna love it. When you're in your late forties and you get to that boy. You're going to love it. you be like, thank God. <laughs> but yeah, right. that's John Adams. Definitely highly recommend. Um, David McAuliffe is a god, so I highly re- recommend any book he's ever written. Um, but this one in particular is very, very good. <clears throat> Sweet. All right, let's move on to some fantasy, folks. Let's get, let's get fantastical about it. Let's get... And just so, uh, this world. for those of you that may be watching this video, um, behind Andrew, you can see a portion of that shelf uh, are mostly his books, and that is a majority fantasy fiction sci-fi bookshelf. So. Um, I like to live outside of reality. Mm. Jesse's more comfortable with the world that we've built ourselves, whereas I'm not. <laughs> I am not. Um, you do have, I mean, you do have a fine line on the top shelf of, I mean, just thick Russian history. See, um, if someone did it right, <laughs> just kidding. I don't support My the war on Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then in the center, this is mostly my stuff. We got my fantasy and fiction, which is a much smaller collection than Andrew's, but you've got it here. I've got some stuff on the bottom that doesn't matter. And then this whole shelf, which is the same size as that same bookshelf, is all nonfiction. And I do have it in chronological order. So what you see behind me is the timeline of that of that shelf. That's impressive, honestly. Oh, yeah. um, there might be a couple that are slightly out of order, but I did the best I could. And just so you guys know, yes, we do have more of a selection than Books a Million. And that's a fact. <laughs> Big fact. So This yeah. this history <laughs> section is bigger than Books a Million's history section. It might be section. twice, twice <laughs> I mean, the size. It's getting tragic in Books mm, a Million. God. Luckily, Barnes and Nobly is still Dude, going Dude, did you see strong. where they took out chairs in Books a Million? Mm-hmm. Did you tell me that? Or maybe my mom? I don't know they if don't I told have you that, but shop me and my dad there. have talked they, about it. It's all they, gone. Because I guess somehow that's what's hurting their business is the fact that yeah. people can sit down and read the books there yeah. instead of buying them. It's not the fact that sure. people are illiterate today. <laughs> that's another thing, <laughs> yeah. All right, so the first one I'm going to review. So Joe Abercrombie, great author. I would compare – look, I – I haven't made this, well, I will make this comparison, but I'm not the one who came up with it. A lot of people say he is the king of Grimdark, which, for mm. those of you who don't know, Grimdark is more, if you've ever seen Game of Thrones, it's a more, everything's gray, no one's really good, no character's safe as far as, like, can they get killed. Yeah. So, like, if like you're it. wanting something where basically anyone could die at any point, and you're just all these morally gray characters where... You know, you're liking people, but you're like, should I like this person? And you kind of almost are like, I can't believe I like this person, but it just kind of is what it is. So anyway, the, Joe Abercrombie has a trilogy um, that is the First Law trilogy, which I have back here, which if you haven't read it, you should. But he has three standalones that come after that, which I would say you don't have to read the trilogy first. I think if you do, it'll add some depth because there are some like – minor characters that bleed over into these three standalones that come chronologically after the events that happen in the first law trilogy um but like if you just want to get a little taste of what joe abercrombie is before you i mean these books are all like seven ish hundred pages um before you like dive into that you might want to uh, get a little taste so if you're going to read them the first one in order is technically best served cold so 
This one I would say is the best of the three standalones. Um, I didn't look it up on Goodreads. I don't know if you want to do that one. Yeah, yeah. Up. So I I would give if we're going on a scale of five, it's a five. On a scale of ten, like it's in the nine to five range. It's a solid book. Um, it is the bigger of the three, but essentially just to give like a small synopsis, it's like it's a revenge story. So essentially what happens first page, this isn't a spoiler, the main character, I mean, talk about a name, I'm probably going to butcher it, it's Mons Caro Mercado. So, hmm. you know, I know what you might say, Jesse, a female lead character, <laughs> I'm out. But, hold on, okay? Wait, who <laughs> hold I? on. Who's the straw man you just made me into? <laughs> All right, that's normally me, okay? I, I'll admit <laughs> So this is not the YA that you're thinking I'm about to build up, I promise. No, so her and her brother are both the leaders of this mercenary group that's in this region in the world Joe Abercrombie's created. Um, essentially, this duke has hired out um, Mercado and her mercenary group to like do their dirty work. So she's kind of gained fame. Anyway, in the prologue, she, her, it's her and her brother, they're like super tight, whatever, um they go and meet with the duke and he who's like employed them and they're meeting with the duke and then like some other higher up people in their mercenary group and then like some other of his advisors right and long story short he tries to kill both mercado and her her brother Mm. so he has like this little balcony thing so her brother gets straight up assassinated killed she sees it happen mercado gets stabbed but she jumps out this window and obviously as you can see, is a thick book. She survives because the whole mm-hmm. book is her on her revenge tour. I think there's five or six people. Could have said the number wrong there, but essentially, it's her hunting down each of those people. Mm. Great story. Um, a little Arya Stark list. Exactly. And mm-hmm. the thing is, you're thinking like, oh well, of course she's gonna kill everybody. Like, there's a number. I'm just saying, read the book. It's really good. There are, if you have read um, the First Law trilogy. And you're thinking of just skipping because, all right, so just a prequel as well, or to preface this, there's a trilogy, three standalones, then another trilogy, all the same world. So if you're thinking, I'm just going to skip, I don't want to do this, none of the characters from the first bit are in this, don't do that because there are some big characters that are in this from the first trilogy that, like, if anyone who has read the first ones, just go ahead, trust me, read these, it'll be worth it, especially Best Serve Cold. If you're going to pick one of these three to read, Best Serve Cold is the one for sure to read. So just to wrap that up, I gave it a five, nine and a half ish out of ten. It's okay. a revenge story. Um, lots of blood and gore. Lot there's a some big twists too, but um there's some really cool characters too in this one. Um uh two I can think of right off the top of my head. I mean, even the main character is really solid. Like she she's a very complex character who, you know, obviously is on this revenge tour with her brother, but there's just a, like Joe Abercrombie really does a good job of writing to um, kind of reveal more details about her and her brother's past because you don't really know who they are. The preface just starts and mm-hmm. you just know that they're the leaders of this group, but they're not in the pre they're not in the original trilogy. So you don't know anything about them. So as the story's going on, that's how you're kind of learning like, "Oh, Maybe was there a reason why she Mm -hmm. potentially got killed? Was it wrong blood? Like, you know, you know, anyway. So, Best Serve Cold, definitely a must read. Even if you've never read any Joe Abercrombie, if you're going to start somewhere, I would start with Best Serve Cold because it doesn't ruin anything for the original trilogy. Okay. Um, And this is, so you gave it a five on mm -hmm. Goodreads. We've got 83,000 ratings with about 4,300 reviews. So, very popular book. This came out in 2009, um, and overall the rating is 4.22 out of 5. So Not solid bad. rating. I mean, higher than John Adams. Um, Not bad. What What totally are the other different. two? So the second one is The Heroes. So the second one in this, so again, these are standalones. It's called The Heroes. So The Heroes, um, 56,000 ratings, 4.32 overall. Um and then the last 4. one 4.32? So mm-hmm. it was higher than Best Serve Cold. Yeah, but it does have like 30,000 less rate, less ratings. And Sanderson wow. has talked about how The Way of Kings took a dagger in that regard because he said whenever anybody's reading the first in like a series or like mm-hmm. even if it, like, I guess this is the fourth, but it's not related to that first trilogy. But he talks about how if they don't like the first one, they're only going to read that one and they're going to give it a bad rating. So yeah. it's going to be higher likelihood that that first one has lowest ratings out of a trilogy. Um, which makes sense. And then what's the third Red one Red Country. So Red Country has, 
It's got to have less than the other two. Uh, it's got 47,000, um, and it has an overall rating of 4.31. All right, so for... 50,000 uh, ratings almost. I mean, that's, that's hard. So, I mean, it's not a bad book. No. Clearly. None of these are bad books, but if I had to rank them, it would be the order that you're supposed to technically read them, even though they're standalones. Um, and that's best served cold, The Heroes, then Red Country. Um, but... That's just me. But they are three completely different books. So uh, first, Best Served Cold, Revenge Story. The Heroes is more of a... So Best Served Cold is like over a, a longer period of time. So you're really getting to like feel the world, feel some different countries and some tensions and all that. Um, the Heroes is like over a span of a couple days. So mm-hmm. it's about this battle, and you're getting the viewpoint. You're getting some POVs of... One side, which is like the Northmen who are seen as like savages, and then the other side, which is like the kingdom, the knights, the civilized people, right? And so you're getting two POVs there, um, and it's just kind of the strategy that goes involved in that war. Um, it's really well written, I will say. Like some of the coolest writing that I've seen um, as far as like creativity, and I think I even told you about it. There's one chapter in specific, um, which I don't think I'm ruining, like spoiling anything with this. Um, cause it is a war and people die, but, um, the, the POV starts off with some like minor character that doesn't matter. And it's him charging into the field, like on the North side, he gets killed and it picks up the next paragraph picks up with the guy who killed him from the other side. Oh, you did. Tell and then me it this. keeps going back That's and really forth cool. where the people just yeah. keep getting killed. And so the whole POV system just keeps changing. Super cool. And then he does it again later on with this letter that needs to get taken to the front lines to kind of adjust the strategy. And like, it just keeps kind of like going through all these different hands. So the, like the POV changes. So he, he's a really creative writer. Um, and then again, there's some, one of the bigger characters from the, uh, original trilogy is in this black Dow. So he was one of the like coolest characters in the first trilogy. He's not a, a major POV. He's not a POV character, but he has a lot of page time like in the background in this. So like anyone who's read the original trilogy, like you would definitely want to know what happens with Black Dow in this one. Um, And then also it's really cool how even though these books are all standalones, um, Joe Abercrombie will like kind of drop these like little like crumbs of like, oh, like Like he's referring. Yeah, he's referring to uh, Mercado. Like someone will bring up the Mercado in in the first book. Um, and talk yeah. about oh that's going on way up north and you right. know whatever so so quick question you said the book's basically a battle it's so, yeah like three or four days it's a battle so like that's pretty sick so are you saying like book starts battle starts book ends battle ends like the basically whole book, like, the whole book is up, war not a lot of no after. yeah so if okay. you're looking for more character development that this one's the that I think that's probably why I like Best Served Cold more mm. is because there is a lot of action, but there is more time for that character development. So the characters I like way more in Best Served Cold, but mm. it's it's a longer book. Mm. It's not it's not as I mean it's still action because I mean it's it's her just trying to kill certain people, but yeah, the heroes it's more strategy and more him showing off his his world building. I would say mm-hmm. so if you really like world building and you like just pure action because he can write like a hell of a war scene or like a a sword fight especially scene because in this world especially like there's not really any magic really at all it's it's more just swords and brute strength so it's just a bunch of like who's who's just more like badass and savage and you're saying Um, if you did just want to read a quick mass battle book that's intense you uh, could read this standalone no matter what oh you could read this without having i mean obviously if you've read some of the other ones you'd have more context but this one's only 500 pages Mm. so you know it's definitely one of the shorter fantasies and the i mean the the pray the word break is pretty big Mm. but um but yeah it's a quick read it's not one that you'd put down because you're like oh i don't i'm not i need more action like that one's basically pure action um but again this one's probably my second favorite in the thing so you said what this one has the highest of the three um, I think you said. I believe so. I think that was like four point three two, and that mm. was four point two two, maybe. They're all right there, though, around the four. So 3, Joe Abercrombie's a solid writer. Clearly. So what I so the last one here that I have right here is Red Country, and I've seen like other book reviewers kind of like bash on this one and say it's kind of like one of Joe Abercrombie's like like step kids almost like he didn't take as much time on this one which i will say this book is i mean as you can tell compared to the other ones this one's not even close to as big as the other ones and this one took me i'm ashamed to like even say how long it took me but this one's like 450 ish 440 mm-hmm. um and 
it's good. Okay, it's not that it's not good, and I actually have like some real hard notes on this. Okay, before, um, right before you do that, what was your rating on this? Five? Yeah, I didn't give a rating. Um, I think I gave it, I'm curious, I might have given it a five on Goodreads just because I'm like, I kind of like suck Joe off low-key because he's <laughs> good, dude. I love like the grim dark stuff, man. It's just such a like good world building, but if I had to go on like a 10-point scale, which I, I feel like I like more, I would give it like an eight four eight like a, a low not over an eight five sure it, what, but i would recommend reading it this one out of i think i might have given this a four if not a three on goodreads and it's probably a seven and a half for me it's still good yeah it's but still like good. Yeah. if i hadn't read i there you, you gotta read if you've read the first trilogy you have to read this book it's like okay. one of those things okay there's someone that's in this book that i can't say because it's huge spoilers yeah um it's kind of like the sanderson thing where you're getting sprinkles man, of characters but from th- other this stuff. one is a main character someone in uh. here and i've already probably said too much because if someone's <laughs> read this they're like but anyway this is a must read if you've read any of these if you've not read any Joe Abercrombie, like this book's gonna mean almost nothing to you. Okay. This book is basically for anyone who has just Made it taken the journey yeah. on with Joe Abercrombie. Um, and if you have, I will say the there's a moment in this book that got me way more hype than any of the moments in these other books. But it's only because of things he set up before. So again, mm. if you haven't read yeah, them, yeah. it's not gonna hit as deep. But as far as Red Country, it's. It's similar esque. It's not. It's almost a revenge, but it's not. Basically, what happens in like the first chapter. So again, not spoilers. Um, this girl, another female main character here. This guy's Watch crazy. out! This, this guy's, guy's progressive. Crazy. As hell. Is this Disney Lucasfilm. <laughs> it what? might be. Um, her name's Shy South, and her, her and this like grandfather figure that's in her life. Essentially, they're like out at the store shopping. They come back and her brother and sister have been kidnapped. Their house has been burned. And this like other elderly person that's living with them is, is been hanged. And so it's like, Oh, what happened? And so essentially there's this like group of guys just going around, like kidnapping children and like killing anyone else. that's like around. And so this whole book is her going on this journey to find her brother and sister Mm -hmm. and her character development along that. And then also there's another big main character, uh, Casca, who was in the original trilogy. He's in uh, the first Best Served Cold um, book. And he's not a POV character, but essentially his like campaign, if you've read the other books, you, you kind of know what I'm talking about. He's, he's doing his thing in this book. And it's more, this is a purely character developmental book. Um, it's not as fast paced. It is definitely a little bit slower because, I mean, it's a, a long journey to go find her brother and sister towards the end though there's some severe action mm. but it is a longer i i was you know moving back here when i was reading this so it took me a while to finish it but mm-hmm. it's definitely my it's tough dude it's almost like when, when it reminds me of you know a lot of people just don't like um rhythm of war they say they don't like it but they you, you hear like oh rhythm of war is just not as good as the other three mm-hmm. to me it's like or even oathbringer i think you might have said that whereas oathbringer i think has the best ending mm-hmm. and like some of the best like pure moments it may not be the best like cover to cover like it's not it's not words of radiance cover to cover but like there's moments in oathbringer to me that are way better than words mm-hmm. of radiance mm-hmm. and that's kind of how this is there's moments in this that are so good especially if you've read the previous but then the rest of it can be kind of mundane yeah but there are some really good moments in it um Hmm. overall yeah i would say like seven and a half is probably the best i could give it but again these are just these are all standalones you don't have to read them in order if you do there are like some cool like easter eggs i would Mm -hmm. say but the first law books are not standalone those three first law are three in a row so you got the blade itself before they're hanged and the last argument of kings which i mean and I'm, this isn't oh dude and if i'm not like i didn't come up with this take but arguably like one of the best characters of all time is in this series mm-hmm. um it's i'll just to like give you an overview he's this inquisitor who's mm-hmm. crippled and mm-hmm. like dude his just logic it's especially if you, like i know how you like dune and like the whole logical battles dude his like whips are just Mm -hmm. he'll just come up and like lacerate someone with his words but then he's just always like so many steps ahead but he's like Mm -hmm. a character that you're cheering for because he's like in pain because he's crippled and he's been through a lot of tragedy but he's an inquisitor so he's low-key like savaging people for no reason almost it seems um 
So he's someone that you end up cheering for, even though he's honestly kind of the bad guy. Kind of like a gray character. Oh, very. Yeah. I mean, everybody in in his stuff is yeah, gray, I guess you but did he's say not. That. Yeah, yeah. He is definitely someone who's who's more seen as someone on the other side that you're they're fighting against. But he just, dude, he just Joe Abercrombie just does such a good job with characters. So if you hmm. like characters, um, I think he gets a lot of knock for world building, hmm. but. That's I think just because he's spending so much more time in character dialogue. Yeah. I mean, his characters you just they're all very memorable and all so different. Like I don't yeah. know, especially like Wheel of Time for me, not really Brandon Sanderson, but I guess some people would probably say that. But like I, I guess when I first read um, The Way of Kings, like some of the um, what is it Bridge Four guys, they kind of bled together for me. I couldn't really remember the differences between some of those Bridge Four guys. I mean, as the books go on, then I get more information, and I do, like, easily I can distinguish between Teft and Rock and all those characters. But, like, Joe Abercrombie, you're never going to confuse. Is mm -hmm. that character? Never, dude. They're mm -hmm. all so different and, like, really dynamic. So, yeah. um, so one of my favorite authors for sure. Yeah, and you're all about characters. You've always said that's your main Love thing. Characters. So you would say I like that world building. It's characters and then probably world building for me. Right, right. Which world building is probably for me the in fa so far in my small yeah. fantasy reading career is is the thing that you know gets me off the most. But so you would say j these books, first law, Joe Abercrombie in general, best character development of the, 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 the for you, dude. It's so tough because obviously our Lord and Savior Brandon Sanderson is so it's tough so to good. say anything bad uh -oh. against. Um, God, dude, it's more. I, I want to say. It, what he does with Shalon, yeah, dude. Honestly, I hate Shalon at this point. But no, we're getting into saying no. I'm kidding. Now. <laughs> it's it's just it's different. The way he writes and he does it in so many like less pages. I, I think I do have to give him the nod in character development, and that's no like slide against Brandon Sanderson, obviously, because his is amazing. Um, I just think what Joe Abercrombie is able to do without the world building, like adding to character development is just so good whereas i don't think i'm not going to say brandon sanderson's like using world building as a crutch to like build characters but like why some of those characters are so cool is because of the world that they live yeah, in and true. like the rules that, in that and world. the rules yeah. that go along with the world yeah, yeah. um whereas like that's not really how it's going down here like mm -hmm. there's some light magic use um especially in the first law trilogy but it's not like, I mean, basically every chapter or every part, especially, you're, like, learning something new about the world, and it's like, wait, that changes everything. Right, and Sanderson, um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. so, okay, so I asked you that. So, Grim Dark. I got two questions. Grim Dark. This is the best. Joe Abercrombie is the best Grim Dark. So, I haven't. So, everyone compares him to George R. Martin. So, okay. they say he's, like, the modern you know, the Song of Ice and Fire guy. Mm -hmm. um, I have only read the first, I've only read A Song of Ice and Fire. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to lie to you, I audiobooked it. So <laughs> did I read it? Yes. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> but I have, in case you guys can't see, I have two copies of the first two books in The Song of Ice and Fire. They're getting read. They are point. getting read. And dude, that's high on my list because, you know, some guys that both of us watch have th that really high up. So mm -hmm. Especially, I've heard... Is it which one is the swords one? Is that the third one? I've heard the swords one. I think it's the third one. A song of dude, swords. It sounds so swords bad. The sword one, dude. <laughs> I can't. Hopefully I'm not no one that likes fantasy is watching this. Like I said, small career in <laughs> fantasy for me, so you can't judge. But uh, okay, so Grim Dark, you have this. You have George R. R. Martin to consider. But from what you've read, this is probably number one overall fiction. Where does Joe Abercrombie or these books specifically land? Or so where does the number best one serve book? cold? Yeah. It's in the top ten. It's okay. probably low in the top ten, okay. like ten. Okay. okay. If it makes okay. it, it's in. If not, it's an honorable mention. It's very close. This one is. And I guess dang, that's just a testament to how much freaking fantasy and fiction you've read. Because well, I mean, yeah, but it's just it's not better than any of the four right now. Uh, of the Stormlight Archive. Stormlights. No, it's I mean, not better than Dune. The first one. No, it's not better than, dude, I mean, shout out to Fonda Lee, and dude, I thought someone was, not one of the dogs was sniffing me for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, as I look back here, yeah, it's definitely not in the top ten. <laughs> but it's good. It's close, though. It's an well, honorable I mean, mention. Yeah. It's like, it's close. For something to not be in the top ten does not yeah. mean that it's not amazing. Well, because these three, because the, the, the first law is 100% in the okay. top ten. Good clarification, okay. Just not, um, 
it's tough. It, Best of Cold could maybe sneak in there. I'll have to do some research and really yeah. look. It would be very close. We'll have that tier list out, and we'll see where we it will. lands. Um, okay, so cool. Character development, obviously, in the heroes, a lot of action, a lot of good stuff. How? What is your overall, in, in considering other fantasy writers like Sanderson or like Fonda Lee, the writing in general, like dense, uh, no. like engaging? He has a lot of dialogue, so... I, I think things move a lot faster in his books. Um, you have less of the what's going on right now. Mm. I have to keep reading to find out. Um, more of the his is it's it's it can get really political because there's a lot of different sides and things going on with that. So you do have to kind of pay attention to the dialogue. And at first, I will say there's just there's a couple of different sides. So like understanding who's on what side. And like what their, you know, potential, like what they, yeah, and what they want, like mm-hmm. what they want out of certain things is kind of dicey at first. But I think that's what makes it good too is trying to figure out because again, all these characters are gray, so they may be on one side, but that doesn't necessarily mean like that they're only going to do things that are in interest of whatever side they're on. So all the characters are gay. They're all homosexual. It's crazy, dude. I love it. But no, um, writing style. Good quotes, dude. You'll have some really good quotes mm. from characters for sure. Um, I love that, lots dude. of action too. I love when you get a solid quote from oh, a fantasy just, uh, character because it like yeah, it well, just he, has a different kind of. He, he kind of does what Brandon Sanderson does. <laughs> Warning. Warning. Um, Honor he, is dead, but I'll see what I can do. I mean, oof, that one's a bar. Top, top oh, tier. Oh, bar. Dude, I didn't tell you. I was gonna send it to you. I called you. You didn't answer. I was looking, I mean, not to, I mean, this is obviously about Joe, and we love you, Joe, but to get back to Sanderson for a second, I read the last page of The Way of Kings, and dude, I totally forgot what happened there. So huge spoiler alert if you haven't read The Way of Kings. Mm -hmm. And yeah, dude, it's literally uh, Dalinar talking to um, the Stormfather. Well, no, it's him in the dream talking about how Honor is dead. And that he was killed by Odium. And I'm just like, oh, bro. Yeah, yeah. you like Dude, get that huge drop and then you go through like, all of Words of Radiance and you don't like really hear about it. Oh, yeah. And then what's crazy is that Words of Radiance ends with Dalinar uh, saying, man, I mean, really spoiler alert. Spoiler <laughs> for, for the Stormlight Archive. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to put that spoiler. We're going to have a video <laughs> about Joe Abraham and John Adams and say also spoiler alert for the Stormlight Archive. But dude, him... It's crazy how the books end. I, and I've only read the first two. You've read the first four. I've only, I'm about to start Oathbringer this week. But um, the Words of Radiance ends with him saying his first oath and getting the Stormfather to Bar. be his friend. So and you're like, like, but what does that mean? Guess I'll find out next guess book. I'll find out in Oathbringer. But actually not until the very end. Yeah. Because but he the books actually that. hard end, and you've confirmed this in the other books, the books hard end with our boy Wit every time. And that Words of Radiance Dude, ending. I don't know how I didn't realize that until after reading the <laughs> The Rhythm of War and I'll, watching I'd the video. I only read two, so I hadn't really had enough, I guess, to put it together. There was all of them, but... Dude, having the prequels, though, always being a different POV character of the night Gavlar dies is... Yeah, dude, it's, it's just... I, I don't know what his, like, storyboard looks like, because... I do wonder, man. I wonder... Do you think all ten books are going to have a POV of the night Gavlar dies? I mean, that would be crazy, Dude, I can't dude. wait many, for you to read man. Rhythm of War. The POV in that is just like, what... Does any of this matter? Like, what happened? Is I everything like, I thought I, I feel knew? Like each book is going to be like that. Did the last book even matter from what I know right now? Because even just Way of Kings to Words, I read Words of Radiance and I was like, one. does the Way of Kings matter? It's one of the best books I've ever <laughs> oh, read, dude. but does it even matter anymore? Bro, the ending of The Rhythm of War, if I were to teleport my time, teleport myself back to uh, The Way of Kings. <laughs> Just nothing matters. Mm, bro. There's nothing for you in the bro, way. Bro, counting ten, 10 heartbeats, bro, you dead, bro. That's all I'm saying. You waiting 10 heartbeats, son, you ain't making it out of. You ain't making it out of Roshar. <laughs> so, again, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Major. We're going to put a major <laughs> spoiler warning for the Stormlight Archive on that little segment. But, oh, God. <laughs> but wrapping it up, Joe Abercrombie, amazing author, grimdark, character development hard. These three standalones. I would go best serve cold if you're looking for an entry into Joe Abercrombie and without. Because honestly, reading this too isn't even going to spoil anything for you in the first three. Mm -hmm. This one, reading Red Country will. I wouldn't read Red Country if you haven't read the original three. So that's my my two cents. Again, great books. And I I haven't read um, The Age of Madness, and all three of those books are out. So 
That's another. I need to get on that. That's, that's, the, that's the, the trilogy after these three. Okay. Yeah, little yeah, hatred. Starts and, with a little hatred. I don't have the third one. I don't know why I don't, because you know me. I like I mean, buying them I'm sets shocked. before I even break a page. I mean, same. Also, I do want to end this review um, by saying um, A Darker Shade of Magic is the worst piece of literature ever written. That's the only. I'm going to end every first single episode. one of our. Every single first one of our episode. episodes. By saying, V.E. Schwab, you're a fraud, and you write YA, okay? So don't ever broadcast your books as non-YA. And that's all I have to say about that. Okay, I loved Harry Potter, but don't ever put your your stuff in the adult fantasy stuff. It's it's because you do a good job with your covers, all right, V.E.? Whoever you got on your cover team, you need to pay them more. Because, man, they wrote me, and I bought the whole trilogy, and I'm... I promise you I will not finish that trilogy. He's going to be hurt when she Unless we get a million this. subscribers. That's the only way I'm somehow finishing the Darker Shade of Magic trilogy. So, so In bad. response to that, anybody that happens to see this and vehemently disagrees with Andrew, yeah. please leave a comment. Let us know <laughs> yeah. um, what please. you think about it and why he should read it. And I'm sure and please he will, leave I'm your sure age also beside <laughs> your comment as well. Because <laughs> I promise no one's paying for their own car insurance who likes that book. <laughs> I promise you. No one, dude. Sheesh. Okay. Right, and that's all. Look, back to Joe. That's fair Great enough. books. Great books, Joe. Great books. Good job, Joe. Um, and just to recap again, John Adams, great if you're trying to get into the founding yes. fathers, break in there, Revolutionary War, French Revolution, all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's been our first uh, cover. Our, this is our first time doing this. Um, so if this ends up actually being on the internet, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm. um, we're figuring it out, but pretty fun um just to kind of say again and maybe we should have said this in the beginning um you know i read a lot of history but i do love a good bit of fantasy as well and i'm starting to read more of it uh loach has delved into both really because you've taught history yeah we're about we're opposites i would say yeah as much fantasy as, far as, what as we've read. jesse's read i've read about that same amount of non but honestly you probably read more fantasy than i've read nonfiction. maybe but anyway i would say it's a fair comparison to say i read a way more fantasy jesse's more interested in nonfiction. And it's not that I'm not. Obviously, I love Russian history. That's more of what I normally am gonna read. Um, but I, I'm fascinated out here. with. I'm fascinated with. <laughs> I'm a comrade. <laughs> but anyway, we'll have to cut that out, <laughs> editor. Please. Um, I no, but say I, one thing: we are on the same page. Is I've bought I've bought just as many nonfiction books that I haven't read yet as you bought fantasy, oh. and vice versa. <laughs> oh, dude, because you because sure, I right. bought a bunch of fantasy that I haven't read yet, and you've got a lot of books up there. Dude, that you I bought read. entire series. Dude, let me let me oh, just yeah, shout dude, out I mean, a got, series yeah. by. Um, I mean, I've got the Lies of Lagomora up there, bro. That I bought. Dude, that one we're gonna read. I've got Red Rising soon. series that I bought. Red Rising, we're also gonna read very soon. Yeah. But shout out the Legacy of Light series by, Matthew, by Ward. Matthew Ward, which shout out Matthew Ward. I'm sure it's an amazing series. You did a hell of a job on your your cover work because that's the only reason I bought all three from Barnes and Noble when I saw them. And uh, the Dark Tower series. Not sure when we're reading that for Stephen King. I mean, you got the whole box set. Dude, down this there, Expanse that. series. I mean, there's just so many. We we have to read that. There's so many. We got to get through all of Three Body. We've both only read the first one, or you're still reading it um there's another one you've got to finish dune i do i'll finish dune soon i mean we haven't Ed read in winter Born. i've heard that series is really good like i've other authors talk about how what is it and have you read those the john of dragons books john? oh yeah dude john gwen they are oh so yeah yeah another thing we'll have to dice this right back in before i started savaging well before we started talking about stormlight and before i savage v schwab if you're someone who doesn't like curse words don't read Joe Abercrombie, my friend. Read the Bible. My man loves a good curse word, dude. And he loves to talk about things very graphically. So I should have said that before. This book is definitely not for you. If you're someone who doesn't like curse words, you're going to be reading a lot of them. And not hell. Okay? Lots of F-bombs. They be saying, damn it. <laughs> they do. They do. <laughs> lots of F-bombs, lots of like talking about sex very provocatively. But I think it's it's not that Joe Abercrombie's doing that unnecessarily. He's painting a dark world. The world yeah. that these guys live in, I, it's a grunge. It's like George, it's like Game of Thrones. It's just it, a, very much so. The world you're living in is bad. It's real. It's a very yeah. real series. So that is what I would say. John Gwynn is Joe Abercrombie who's been to VBS. <laughs> so <Vacation> just, <laughs> yeah, just as good, almost like in some ways, his character development is very close, I would say. I don't think it's as good, 
there's some characters that are close, but no cuss words. He he like formulates. He's like Sanderson. They, he like formulates his own curse words yeah. in the world. Yeah, and um, no sex. Well, so there is, but it's just he. It's it's alluded to, right? Kind of like Sanderson, like in yeah, Warbreaker. Exactly. It's, Which, it's but it's way more illusion. Like some yeah. bad things are happening. Um, Warbreaker was a bad example, actually. Yeah. That's his most sensual. Look, <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But um. Anyway, it, it's just it is graphic. I will say that very graphic. But I don't. If you can get through it, I think it actually makes the characters more real um, for you. But anyway, those are our thoughts, or those are my thoughts, at least on. And I'll these have to read them eventually. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got two hundred books to read before then. Yeah. But we'll we'll read other things first, but eventually. So, signing off then. Signing off. All right, that's Warbreaker. Itlet's book reviews. Um, my name is Brad Pitt. This is Denzel Washington. It's been a pr- pleasure. Um, stick around. See what happens next. Uh, we will be reviewing. Just to, if you want a little tidbit, we do have Dune coming up. We'll have some Stormlight action coming up. Mm-hmm. I've got a lot of history to get through. We are going to have some tier lists um, in yeah. different categories and then just overall. Uh, so we'll have some cool books coming out. Um, we have, uh, like I've said, we've... You know, we're young men, but we've read a, a good bit for this point, and we love reading, so we just kind of want to chat about it and, you know, see if we can get other people into some of the books we like and talk with strangers about it, because that's yeah. fun. So, And if there's a series that should jump up... Let us know. Mm, let, let us, us know, know what we need to be reading. Um, I'd especially love to hear some uh, But if it's why, leave it off. Yeah, if it's V. Schwab, don't tell Andrew, because he'll, <laughs> he'll have a conni- conniption fit. Um, but all right, that's it. It's Lit Book Reviews, Episode 1. I think we're done. Peace. Peace.